On the 1st of November 1992, the Hoover Corporation, a popular home appliances company, advertised a promotion that seemed almost too good to be true. Buy a fairly standard vacuum cleaner and you'd be treated to the vacation of a lifetime in America, completely free of charge. By any standard, it was a suspiciously good deal. A deal so good, in fact, that fulfilling their side of it would all but bankrupt Hoover and destroy their reputation for decades to come. Prior to 1992, Hoover was a reputable brand. The origins of the company date back to 1908, when William Henry Hoover, no relation, bought the patent for an upright vacuum cleaner from a department store janitor named James Murray Spangler. Spangler, a lifelong asthmatic, had invented the machine primarily to replace the extremely dusty carpet sweeper he had to use at work. At this point in history, vacuum cleaners did already exist, but they were far from convenient. Few people owned a vacuum cleaner, but instead rented one when their house needed cleaning. It would turn up, pulled by a couple of horses and operated by a team of experienced workmen, who would feed a tube in through a window or door in order to vacuum your home. By contrast then, a compact vacuum cleaner you could store in the cupboard under the stairs was a pretty big improvement. While Spangler might have invented the vacuum cleaner, it was Hoover who branded it with his name and brought it to the masses. In the UK, where Hoover went on to become an incredibly popular brand, vacuum cleaners were, and still are, usually referred to as Hoovers, which, at least, sounds better than Spangler's. The company made a few other products, including washing machines, but for the most part, vacuum cleaners was their bag, which became a problem when svelte, exciting-looking newcomers like Dyson started manufacturing rival products. At the end of the 1980s, Hoover, having never had to fight for market dominance before, suddenly found itself with warehouses full of unsold products just gathering dust, and not in the way they were supposed to. Something had to be done, something that would make a name for Hoover, something that would make vacuum cleaners exciting again. What Hoover executives settled on was a promotion in cooperation with JSI Travel a travel agent that found itself in a similar position to Hoover. Hoover needed to unload thousands of vacuum cleaners, JSI needed to unload thousands of cheap flights. Leaving aside the fact that international travel has absolutely nothing to do with vacuum cleaners, it was the perfect match. Under the terms of the promotion, any customer who spent more than £100 on Hoover products at a participating department store would get two free round-trip tickets to one of a number of European destinations. Buy a Hoover, fly to Spain for a weekend. As exciting prospects went in the early 1990s, it was a pretty good deal. At first, everything worked out fine. Not everyone claimed their free flights, since you had to go through a tedious process of requesting forms and mailing in vouchers in order to do so. Plus, quite a lot of people spent way over the £100 minimum on Hoover products. Which was brilliant. Hoover made money. They shifted stock from their warehouses. They were relevant again. Everything seemed rosy. So long as they didn't do anything incredibly foolish, their brilliant free flights promotion might just save the company. At some point, however, Hoover decided to build on their already generous offer. If people liked free flights to Europe, surely they'd love free flights to America. So, in round two of their promotion, Hoover broadened their offer to include flights to New York and Orlando. Fatally, however, they didn't change the minimum spend. You still only had to buy £100 worth of Hoover products. If their offer had been unbelievable before, it was now absolutely insane. Two round-trip flights to a popular European destination would cost just under £100 in 1992. Offering these flights for free with a £100 purchase, therefore, wasn't too hard on Hoover's wallet. Two round-trip flights to America, on the other hand, cost around £600. Offering them for free with a £100 purchase was the kind of deal that everyone, except for apparently Hoover, knew couldn't last for long. 
Hoover products flew off the shelves. And unlike before, people were just buying the cheapest qualifying item and were making sure to request their tickets. As thousands more requests than they'd been expecting started rolling in, Hoover realized they needed to pull the plug. At this point, Hoover shifted quickly into damage control mode. They definitely couldn't afford to actually give out all the free flights they were on the line for, but on the other hand, they didn't have the nerve to just completely refuse. In a somewhat desperate move, they took refuge in the terms and conditions. The process for claiming tickets had already been quite complicated. Now Hoover made it unbearable. They offered people flights which departed from airports hundreds of miles away from where they lived to destinations in America they didn't really want. They stipulated flights that departed in the middle of the night or that required huge layovers. They were basically as awkward as they possibly could be in the hopes that people would give up. Some people did. Others did not. Indeed, Hoover's reluctance to pay up actually seemed to fuel a lust for justice in some consumers. Within weeks, angry Hoover owners all over the UK had united to form the Hoover Holidays Pressure Group, which issued the questionably reassuring statement, we don't want blood, we want tickets. It's approximately here that things started to get a bit out of hand. Members of the pressure group pooled their funds, bought shares in Hoover's parent company, and then turned up at the annual general meeting to harangue the CEO in person. As an aside, they had to pay for flights to America in order to do this, something which you have to imagine probably only made them angrier. The BBC waded in, making the consumer crisis into national, then international news. Sensing blood in the water, consumers all over the UK filed claims against Hoover in the small claims court. The whole thing was turning into the kind of mess that even Hoover couldn't sweep under the rug. And then, just when things couldn't get any worse, there was the hostage crisis. A Hoover customer, David Dixon, already irate at not having gotten his free tickets, was further put out when the washing machine he had bought to get them broke down. Worse still, the Hoover engineer sent out to fix the machine had some choice words for David. If you think buying a washing machine is going to get you two tickets to America, said the engineer, you must be an idiot. Incensed, David took action. He stormed outside and used his company lorry to barricade his driveway, effectively taking the Hoover engineer's van and equipment hostage. Tense negotiations ensued. Hoover called up David and tried to guilt him into releasing the van. The police turned up, took one look, and decided that they weren't getting involved. And, meanwhile, the crisis made headlines around the world. David received hundreds of calls from well-wishers. The public was well and truly on his side. News corporations in America even offered him the free trip he'd been denied, and furthermore promised to pay his legal fees if the matter did end up in court. Watching all this play out, Hoover decided that it would be in their best interests not to prod David any further. They never took him to court, and satisfied with his free trip to America, even if it wasn't on Hoover's money, David eventually released the van. Not every lawsuit was so easy to resolve. For eight years, cases dragged on through the courts, garnering constant negative publicity for Hoover. Documentaries were made, books were written, unwanted Hoover products were gifted and re-gifted, and the company's reputation went steadily down the pipe. A particular low point must have been when they were stripped of their royal warrant. The king, we can presume, now uses a Dyson for all his vacuuming. The company didn't actually go under, although in an unamusing twist, the debacle did contribute to the closure of a British factory and the loss of hundreds of jobs. With operations moved abroad, the company struggled on, eventually diversifying into air purifiers and microwaves. Today, they do still run the odd promotion here and there, but they keep things pretty tame. 
there are relatively few ways that a free handheld mop can go wrong. Hoover's brand image has somewhat recovered, but a lot of people haven't forgotten, especially those who were in the pressure group. Some among them spent years of their lives and thousands of pounds seeking justice from Hoover, only to ultimately be awarded a sum of around £400 on average for all their time and trouble. A settlement which, to put it mildly, sucks. <laughs> <laughs>